Okay, uh, I'm here to talk about Linux Food and Core Boot on hyperscalers, and this is one of my collection of dead BIOS pictures. Uh, this is a McDonald's in Amsterdam, and it's kind of a reminder that in our data centers, our systems are actually not general purpose or special purpose, and we don't ever want our special purpose systems to do what this special purpose system did, or what 4,000 special purpose Sandia systems did in a cluster once, where they came up and said, no keyboard attached, hit F1 to continue. And they had to send 20, they had to send 20 people out with 20 keyboards to hit F1 to continue. And two days later, it happened again. So this is about Linux boot and core boot at hyperscalers. I've actually changed the title, and that's because when I initially proposed the title, the world was a different place. Uh, ByteDance hadn't announced that they were deploying Linux boot and core boot at scale, and we didn't have a Sapphire Rapids with core boot uh, out on the floor there, uh, courtesy Meta and Intel. So the world is actually changing rapidly, and the talk had to, too. So I started the Linux boot project about five years ago, uh, it's a Linux kernel and a init RAMFS and Flash. It was very, very explicitly a UEFI project, and as you've noticed, there's a lot of UEFI talked about today and out on the floor there with Linux boot in it. We deployed it at scale December 2020, and it actually has been deployed at other hyperscalers and companies. I don't even know them all anymore. I get contacted occasionally by a company who says, oh yeah, we, we're running it too, and we've been running it for three years. I've had no idea. Uh, what also happened as a result of this is Meta and Intel started an NDA, multi-party NDA, and uh, they've also, for the last three or four OCPs, presented chipsets running Core Boot and Linux Boot, and there are now actually three in the um, Experience booth, actually. Uh, and as a result of the Meta and Intel sort of initiating this and initiating the NDA, uh, Core Boot is now plan of record at several hyperscalers, including mine. So, but you can see more about uh, Core Boot at ByteDance at this uh, site, and you can look this up, this URL up later when you look at the video. So we've not only got the multi-party uh, Meta, Intel, and others uh, thing going, we've got one with AMD on the room. So how do we create Linux Boot on UEFI? So here's kind of the notional UEFI picture you can see in all the books. The red is stuff that's always going to be closed source. The orange is stuff that is maybe potentially available as open source, it's never delivered as open source. And the green is the stuff that you control because you know it's Grub and Linux and things like that. And so our first step is to get rid of stuff. And we just remove as much as we can. And eventually we're here. And what we've done, and this is what we deployed at scale at Google, and I think ByteDance has too. Uh, we've gotten rid of a lot of drivers. There was one driver maybe, sometimes we replaced with an open source driver. A lot of other stuff is gone. You can see what was in red is now largely gone, and there's things in green. One thing is a Linux kernel, and another is a user land written in Go called Uroot, which is, again, fairly widely used as part of Linux boot deployments. And those, in turn, boot a target OS kernel using kexec. So we had pretty good results. We knew that in March 2017 we needed to make this public, but we needed wide usage because that's how we get the momentum to sort of grow it. Uh, and so, but our surprise was that we released this in March 2017 and we had some initial code out there and that summer a car manufacturer got in touch with us and said they were using it on their car manufacturing line and the reason is a 15 minute outage on a car manufacturing line is measured in a cost of millions of euros in this case and so the reboot time was just eating them alive and, and Linux boot immediately solved a problem for them. So, Things were rolled out in 2017. Hyperscaler rolled it out in 2018 on switches. APAC companies were getting in touch with me as early as 2019 to tell me they were rolling it out. Uh, we deployed it at scale at Google, and then all of a sudden, from out of nowhere, I had no idea this was going on. ByteDance reported in September 2021 that they had actually deployed it as well. Uh, Linux boot works just fine across x86 and ARM. I forgot to add RISC V and Power. I've done it on all those as well. And the LVBR actually was in, partly inspired by, I think, Linux boot and our work on Linux boot. And the neat thing is, when we have done this in practice, I can build a Linux boot binary, give me six or eight motherboards, a mix of Intel and AMD x86 hardware, the same Linux boot binary will walk, work across all those boards. And so that's something we've never really had in firmware before, and it, it's really very nice. So Linux boot allowed us to reduce and replace much of UEFI. 
And I guess what happened is Jonathan Zhang and others at Meta said, well, how about removing and replacing the rest of what remains? And that's what they pushed. So they wanted to replace it with Coreboot. Now Coreboot's a project that's actually pretty old at this point. I started in 1999 when I had fewer gray hairs at Los Alamos National Labs. And it really literally is that, Linux is your BIOS. And so it, it consisted of a very small startup piece of code. On one chipset, I got it down to roughly 200 bytes and then a Linux kernel. And we actually deployed Linux BIOS on uh, several top 10 supercomputers between 2002 and 2005. The German government picked it up and they sponsored laptop support from 2006 to 2008. And actually the German government has an organization called BSI. You can look, look it up, bsi.de. And to this day, uh, BSI is continually pushing and mandating core boot on critical government infrastructure purchases they make. So the German government is very interested in buying, let's just say, network switches that run core boot. And they, they work very hard to make that happen. Corbett's also been used in Chromebooks since 2011 and ARM Chromebooks since 2014. Uh, and Tesla, you can actually go to GitHub and see Tesla's Corbett repo. Who has a Tesla here? Anyone? Oh, darn. I was going to say, oh, oh, you're writing on Corbett. Too late. Um, anyway, so our path to Corbett looks like this. So we, we, on the left is kind of where we were five years ago. We would have you know, our proprietary BIOS, everything in red, and we'd have a few modifications we made. And the thing we rolled out in December 2020 is, is, that, is the next one over, where we have a Linux kernel and, and, and uroot user space. And we've reduced that proprietary BIOS quite a bit. Uh, the next thing that's going to be coming out is Linux kernel drivers uroot, and then this thing called min platform, which Nate and, si and Isaac gave a nice talk on. And that's EDK2, and it's kind of partly open source and partly not. And by the way, at the bottom, you also do see there's this sort of irreducible minimum set of blobs you can never get rid of. So we're not really claiming we can get rid of all, everything. It's just not going to happen. We're never going to really replace the memory reference code at this point, even though we did do that in 1999. It's not possible anymore. But anyway, on the far right, where we're headed and, and where we've actually done one, one internal deployment is Linux kernel drivers, uroot user space, and core boot with those chipset vendor blobs. This is what was interesting. This, this September article came out about ByteDance, and I'd been talking to them for a while. They've been a real active participant in, in several areas, and they came up with the best name ever in the world for firmware, cloud firmware. I think it's brilliant. Uh, but if you look, um, they say, look, here's our first production thing. We took Linux boot, and they don't mention uroot, but it's in here, and we put it on top of EDK2, which is sort of you know, partly open source. And uh, what's that say, Ryan, 10 minutes or five minutes? 10 minutes, okay. And uh, you know the silicon code. And notice, again, uh, ByteDance also shows this sort of irreducible minimum bit of silicon code that we're never, we all know we're never going to get rid of that on, in the x86 world. But if you look at their cloud firmware 2.0, that's where it gets kind of interesting because they're score boot. And then if you look at cloud firmware 3.0, what I really love about this picture is they show silicon A and silicon B. And you know, making it clear that they see this as a portable, you know, multi-architecture, multi-vendor uh, picture in their future, I think. So Corvid improves security because, well, a lot of reasons, and we found other ways it improves it at Google, but it's statically linked. Uh, if you really look and understand and worked with UEFI much, you know that UEFI delays the bindings until actually you turn on the processor and start running things. So with UEFI, you don't really quite know what you have, what it does, and what it needs until it starts running. And to give you a kind of a similar thing, it's as though in Linux you had to load every kernel module to find out what its name is. That's kind of the, the, the UEFI model of drivers. Um, core boot, we statically link everything. We know exactly what's in there and what exactly is needed. And if you don't need it, it's not in there. That's a big advantage in security. We've got an open source code base, and I don't, I don't think anyone believes that highly, many eyes is the way to go anymore, but many highly skilled eyes does work very well. It's had 20 years of hardening, and it's been in consumer world for 11 years. And consumer world is a very, very challenging world for security because you've given up physical possession of the device to the consumers. They can do anything they want, and you've got to remain secure. That's actually a much harder problem than a data center. It improves code quality because it's a very small code base. Um, it's got a large set of contributors. 90% of the code in Core Boot is common to all the platforms. So fixing a bug in one thing and fixing it for everything is a very common experience. 
I know from my experience with UAFI, generally I get a siloed per platform instance and I can maybe fix it on one platform and I've got to go fix it on every other platform assuming the code's even remotely compatible, which you, it usually isn't. Every commit to core boot results in a full build across 252 main boards. It doesn't get in if it breaks a build on any board. And it's the same code base for 252 main boards across five architectures. So here's how Coreboot helped me in one project in Google. I had a board with 228 Dixies, with the drivers. I was able to remove 122. Any more than that, it seemed like it would boot. We could remove a driver and it would boot, and a week later we would see some kind of weird problem. And the only answer I could ever get from anyone is, don't know why you can't remove it, don't know what it does, don't remove it because something bad might happen. And that's just a heck of a way to work, right? It's really a miserable environment to be in. Uh, and further, when I'm trying to fit Linux boot in there, it's a it was a real struggle just to free up even a small amount of memory to put a Linux kernel in. So this was getting tough. Intel gave us a hand here. They were able to give us the FSP for the chipset on this particular board, moved the core boot, freed up 10 megabytes instantly, which meant I could not only fit a Linux kernel in all of Uroot, which is the Go user land we use to boot, we could fit in other utilities, like the Intel utility that modifies the Ethernet uh, device of parameters. So it really having that 10 megabytes free was just fantastic. We were able to really find out what was going on, and we got better security and faster boot. So Linux boot, when we started it, UEFI project, we said that over and over again, this is a UEFI project. And it did allow us to remove a lot of UEFI, but then it led other companies to say, look, a lot of it is gone. What do I have to do to get rid of the rest of it? And those companies started to push really hard for core boot, and that's here we are, where we are today. Intel Sapphire Rapids, Meta and Intel started this multi-party NDA collaboration. Others joined ByteDance, WeWin, and so on. I put Google last because actually the level of our contributions has been actually very small. We've benefited from all that good work, but we haven't had to do a lot of work. I'll be admit it, right? I, I wouldn't want to claim anything else because people who made that happen are in the room. Um, but I did start a, a multi-party NDA on the AMD room with Google and Datacom Electronics and some other hyperscalers I can't name yet, and we are working on uh, getting a fully open source stack on the x86 on the AMD server part. So the model, this model really works well. Uh, but again, one of the surprises is you start out with this thing you're saying is explicitly UEFI and all of a sudden you find out it's, well, it's also a core boot project too. And that's how hyperscalers are using core boot and Linux boot. We would appreciate anything you want to tell us, anything you want to do, any contributions you want to make, any experiences you want to report with the code. We have a Slack at opensystemfirmware.dev, slack.osfw.dev. Uh, core boot is now available commercially for an OCP platform. Uh, WeWin's been a big contributor and, and they've made this available in the open system firmware GitHub repo under Delta Lake. You, you pull that down, there's one script, you run the script, it builds you an image. You can take that image and the rules are the rules. If you build an image and it's a really good image, you can give it to anyone anywhere. That's the rules of open system firmware. So you can share it, you can improve it, you can feed it back. All that is now the model of open system firmware. Uh, and there will be more in 2022. Actually, I've left Ampere out because when I wrote this, I didn't know about Ampere. So that's how fast this is moving and actually, the, the Sapphire Rapids thing on the floor, it's not any of these. It's a third party, another manufacturer that I think will be releasing in 2022. So this is moving fast now. Finally, of course, there's linuxboot.org. Uh, so that, I guess, is it. Thank you.